YouTube battle community, Beach Boys fans, random people on the internet. My name is Giggins, and we're back for another episode of the Fuel Flows box set with Dreadful Dan. How's it going, Dan? Brilliantly. I'm having a great time. Um, I haven't been doing anything last uh, week since we last spoke. Just been sitting here waiting attentively or with bated breath. Haven't moved an inch. Yeah. <laughs> Except for my shirt. <laughs> You're still wearing the same thing, but I changed my shirt. <laughs> That is a beautiful t-shirt. I was just about to compliment you on it. Thank you. I got that for apparently being a top listener on Spotify. Really? So that made me happy. Yeah. Well, they sent like an email out. It was like, you're one of the top percent of people that play the Beach Boys. Here's a shirt you should buy. No and way. I was like, well, damn. So I bought one. Actually, I bought two because I'm going to use one for a giveaway at some point. So I don't know right. if it's still available. Um, I'll send you the link. If I could find yeah. it again. Yeah. Well, send me a link to the giveaway. Is oh, yeah. Open to UK, uh, UK everyone, followers? everyone. <laughs> yeah. When I hit a thousand followers on, on Instagram, because uh, Instagram for me, like just a slow growth. I don't know what's going on with that thing, but what eventually, I don't know. Your stuff on Instagram's great. Well, thanks, man. I don't know. You too. Well, you have good lighting on your pictures. You have a really good setup, like with your pictures. Thanks. You're very aesthetic. So if you're not following Dan, <laughs> at dreadful dan's discs on instagram That's the one. but um yeah, come along we're back on the voyage of the few flows box set where we talked about sunflower we talked about the bonus tracks on it we've been talking about their the era of the beach boys in 1969 and 70 and now we're getting into the surf's up era which for a lot of people is one of their favorite eras of the group and there's so many fantastic songs on this record and it's just an amazing little body of work i mean it's one of those albums where it feels so cohesive even though there's so many different stories on here they all kind of feel like they were meant to be together even though some of them come from total opposite ends of the earth um what are your kind of general thoughts on this one i feel that there's maybe a few songs here that stick out like a sore thumb i think with one or two swaps they could have made a far more coherent album um I think Sunflower hangs together a bit a bit better. Um, but again, as with Sunflower, there's all this fantastic material around it and you kind of think, oh, if they could have just put that on there. But obviously we know the background here. I think the band pulling away from each other after this kind of nice idyllic period of being on the same page, yeah. um, starting to fracture, starting to fragment. Um, and Jack Riley coming in and ostensibly trying to kind of like pull it in one direction but i think maybe causing even more of a schism interesting <laughs> we can get into the politics <laughs> as we go um, things do boil but... come to a head yeah <laughs> overall there's some great stuff here like including one of the bands well two of the two of their best songs in my opinion till i die and surfs up yeah hands down um, you might not have noticed, Giggins, I don't know if you did, but my background's changed ever so slightly. Oh, what, what happened back there? At the time you didn't move, how did those things change? <laughs> We've gone back in time. So I had the uh, box set LPs out. Yeah. I've got the original UK issues. So Look at those. This is the stateside. Oh, man. That is so cool. See that EMI logo on there? Wow. Yeah, so what's uh, funny is EMI distributed capital in the uh, UK as well. So oh, while the, while the band were trying to get away from their capital contracts, they end up signing <laughs> this deal with EMI, oh my who God. then have access to all their capital stuff here in the UK. So wow, we, uh, we kick off the album with Cotton Fields. Very interesting. I love that it's on the album, but such a strange opener to jump from there to slip on through. Huh. Yeah, I mean, we spoke last time, didn't we, about how Slip On Through is such a great opening track. Oh, yeah, it's perfect. Um, yeah. Does the US copy come in a gatefold? It does. Uh, the exact same thing. Yeah. Yep. Wow, that's, that's that. cool. Um, Are those hard to find over there? Not all that hard i don't think um, it's sold better in that country yeah it's it's one of the scarcer ones to find but it's not like a 
you know, once in a lifetime thing like you described. <laughs> yeah, sunflower um, over here is pretty darn hard to find. Surf's up's nice. It's got this like textured sleeve. Oh, it's got the state side um, at the top as well. Look at that. Cool. Huh. I've never seen that before. And ah. A little depressing picture there of some dry sand. <laughs> I always think it's a shame. And again, it supports the kind of like narrative of Brian being sick and all this sort of thing. But why did they use this horrible picture? I, I know of all the pictures they could have picked, it looks like he was like mid thought or mid sandwich. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. Poor guy. Yeah. Um, well, it's funny you mentioned that because I was looking at the cover of Best of the Beach Boys Volume 1 the other day. And Al's picture looks like he like just took a breath or just sneezed. And it's like, of all the pictures of Al you could have picked, that's the one you went with? Oh, uh, okay. I've got this as well. I don't know if you see all these. As you can tell, it's shiny. Yeah. This is a... I don't know if you, if you got this in the States, but it uh, surfs up on caribou. What? I've never seen that. Was it issued in the late 70s? Yeah, I think it's 79 or 80. I'm wondering if they... Huh. I've never seen anything like that before. Yeah, it's pretty cool, isn't it? I don't think they... That is awesome. I don't think they put out Sunflower, which is really weird. I think they just did Surf's Up. That's weird. It's a weird little anomaly. Another mystery in the Beach Boy story. <laughs> One of every... Every little second they wow. live, it's a mystery. <laughs> One every that time. is a very far out label. Very jarring to see the caribou with surfs up. That's very weird, yeah. but I like it. Culture clash. Yes. Uh, anyway, shall we get into, I think we're at the point where we're going to talk about what's going on in terms of like recording what are the songs that the band are doing at this time? Yeah. Uh, I thought it'd be good just to cl like clear up the landlocked question because a lot of people seem to get confused about this. Yeah. I think that there was like a a scrapped album called Landlocked, which right. isn't quite true. True, yeah. So, I mean, the band pick up stuff pretty quickly because um, last song recorded for the Sunflower was uh, Cool Cool Water in July. Um. And on the 31st of July, they are back recording Seasons in the Sun. Now, I don't think that was ever intended for Surf's Up, and there's quite some uh, interesting stuff about that session, but we'll yeah. come to that when we uh, talk about it. Um, but then stuff kind of begins in earnest um, from the 14th of August, and they do Looking at Tomorrow, Till I Die, uh, Big Sur, yeah. H E L P is on the way. <laughs> <laughs> Spelling is on the way. Um, and at this point, after that little clutch of songs, um, basically on the 1st of September 1970, which interestingly is the day after Sunflower is released, they assemble the master reel for a potential second brother LP. Yeah. Um, and that is what has come to be known as Landlocked. Right. Um, so <laughs> this is what's on the reel. Loop-de-loop. -loop. <laughs> they just will not <laughs> stop. They will not give up. <laughs> Susie Cincinnati. Ah, uh, of course. That song is Teflon. Yeah. <laughs> uh, San Miguel. Oh. H-E-L-P, Take a Load Off Your Feet, Carnival, I Just Got My Pay, Good Time, Big Sir, Lady, When Girls Get Together, Looking at Tomorrow, Till I Die. What the hell is that checklist? <laughs> <laughs> Very Can you imagine if that come out? Oh, God, no. Awful career death. I mean, <laughs> awesome songs, but again, you know, matched up together don't make any sense. Having Carnival and Till I Die in the same album, no, absolute <laughs> cluster F. 
<laughs> so that doesn't go any further, thankfully. Thank and, God. Um, then there's some erratic recording. Um, 31st of October, Halloween, 1970. Yeah. My, My solution. solution. Um, so good. And then November, Sound of Free, which I think is just a Dennis Solo thing. I don't think any of the other guys are on that at all. I know Mike wrote the words, but I don't know if the yeah. rest of the guys are on it or not. But yeah, mostly Dennis and Daryl Dragon. Yeah. The captain. Uh, Rumbo. R- yeah, Rumbo. <laughs> Rumbo. Dennis Wilson and Rumbo makes it sound like some kind of zany TV show. Like <laughs> Dennis and this, like, I don't know, it's like invisible small pink elephant that only he can see. <laughs> <laughs> Next on Fox Kids, Dennis and Rumbo. (laughs) Um, So then basically 1971 is when most of this album gets recorded uh, between April and June. So that's when we get Don't Go Near the Water, Long Promised Road, A Day in the Life of a Tree, Surf's Up, Fourth of July, Disney Girls, Barbara, uh, Wouldn't It Be Nice to Live Again, Won't You Tell Me, uh, something called Telephone Backgrounds, mm. which isn't on the box set. Yeah. Um, and then dates for kind of like Dennis's stuff for a bit um, less less well documented, I think. Yeah. Um, oh, July, then It's a New Day, Behold the Night. Uh, also, Feel Flows, Student Demonstration Time, Take a Load Off Your Feet, which I think is more like overdubbing on the stuff track they recorded for Sunflower. Um, yeah, and then like more Dennis Wilson stuff kind of uh, stretching throughout the rest of the year. Yeah. Um, ecology, Baby Baby, Old Movie, Make It Good, apparently. That might have been more into 72, I think. Um, and something called Slow Song. So hmm. we can, we can uh, have some conjecture on what that might be now that we've got some extra stuff on the box. Yeah. See, like at that point, I really think it was Jack Riley's influence, but they hit such a mature peak with all those songs you listed. They were just striking gold every single time. I mean, totally. they were hitting A list, A level, A tier, or whatever the kids call it these days, um, <laughs> songs. And when you look back at that track list that you mentioned before, I mean, these new songs beat the crap out of those songs. Yeah. Like, I would, take a, hun- I would take a hundred Don't Go Near the Waters over H-E-L-P any other day. And yeah. they nailed it. Yeah, there's a real maturing, isn't there, in the songwriting, yeah. like musically and lyrically. Yeah. Um, and for me, it's like, I'm, you know, I'm such a big Dennis fan. Same. Um, but I think what's interesting, I don't know if this like hastens the uh, progress he makes, but, you know, he, he hurts his hand, I think around like summer 71. Yeah. Um, and that's it. He won't be able to play drums again until I think like 74. Yeah, it's almost two or three years. Yeah. So I don't know if that means, I mean, I think he said it was like six months again before he could even play the piano. So maybe again, this is just conjecture, but did he then, you know, use that time to focus on all this great stuff that was going to end up on his purported solo album? Poops. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I'd believe that for sure, you know, and I also think he got bored fast. So it, it might've been all right that he wasn't playing drums for a couple of years because they ended up getting yeah. Ricky in the band anyway. And he's a fantastic drummer. So I think he was yeah. stoked to be up front and play piano and sing and do something different. Um, Cause especially during that time, he was so creatively on fire that to do something else for him instead of just being the drummer was probably really exciting for him. So hurting his hand may have been a, a blessing in disguise but yeah. um yeah the earlier in the year well, they do uh david frost show appearance which I, i've never seen it um where they play uh lady uh forever and vegetables i think those tapes are gone i'd love to see that because you've got two songs with dennis up front basically like as the, the front man i know um and apparently he's talking then to David Frost like about I'm making this film, Two Lane Blacktop. Oh my god! So that would have just been like the superstar kind of like mainstream interview for like god. Dennis shine a light on him. As yeah, really cool. 
Oh my god. god. And like I know Tears in the Morning, that film was lost. They were on the, the top of the pops or something we talked about last time. That was gone. But that was common practice back in those days. No one thought any of this would be important 50 years later. I mean, you just taped over what you had and reused the tape so it wore out and you made your next show for the next day. No one thought any different of it. So I mean, something like that where they played Lady and for, um, Forever. Oh my God. Somebody plays. Someone's got it. Someone has. To. What I would love for them to do is put out a really high res 4K video restoration of all their official videos because the stuff that's on YouTube looks like garbage. Like, <laughs> don't go near the water. It looks like it was filmed through a pillow. <laughs> it looks horrible. And I know somebody <laughs> somewhere at Brother Records has the original tape. Like, hell, I don't know what to do. I'll go in there and clean it up. Because, like, people would eat that stuff up so fast. They thought Feel Flow so fast. Put out a video <laughs> documentary. Boom. Next time. Get on it. Get on it, Alan. Alan and Mark. <laughs> Alan Mark. <laughs> Forget about Carl and the Passions. But right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so, should we do what we did again for Sunflower? We're just going to go yeah. through every single one of these songs. Let's do it. So, let's go with Don't Go Near the Water. Love what are it. your thoughts on that? Absolutely love it. It's such a anti Beach Boys title. You know, we've we've spent the last ten years at this point talking about sun and surf, and all of a sudden they're like, "Hey, wait, wait, wait! We, humans have really messed up this planet. We got to take better care of it. Don't just jump in." And Al's middle bit, toothpaste and soap will make the ocean a bubble bath. I mean, like the way he sings that so passionately, you could tell he was having the time of his life with that part. It's one of the most memorable parts on the entire album. Um, yeah. Yeah. Fantastic song. The little bubbly sounds in the background. The, their background vocals are great. It's such a groovy little track. Love it. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of, it's got a little bit like tough, funky sound to it. It's not yeah. just, I mean, it, it is, feels like the big kind of like pop song on the album, but it has got that, you know, bit of a bit of a funky groove going on. Yeah. Um, this uh, these versions on the box set as well, fantastic stripping away everything. Oh, I know so much going on in the arrangement. That I hadn't realized so good. Whole new life um, song. Yeah, and like I think I said when we first started talking, I didn't realize they're singing um, "Dirty Water." I know. Yeah, I never heard that. Yeah, I same. Just thought it was like um, do you, uh, like heroes and villains. Kind right. Of thing. Right. Yeah. The exact same thing, man. Yeah. <laughs> what did you think of this version that we've got with like weird alternative kind of like scratch vocal? I dig it. I, I love seeing the growth of a song, like the, the gestation yeah. of it and seeing just how it grows on its own and what becomes natural and what they sing just becomes more easier to get out than the lyrics they may have written. Um, I'm a huge fan of the songwriting process. You know, maybe not you five these... CDs worth of Heroes of Villains, but... So. <laughs> But do you think these lyrics were written? It sounds like Al's just improving this stuff about it killed my dad. Oh, yeah. That I, honestly, I think that stuff was done as a joke. I think they were goofing around with the song as it was and just having a laugh. I really don't think yeah. it was meant to be anything taken seriously. Yeah. <laughs> I loved that when I first heard it. I was like, excuse me. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> Yeah, it's nice no, Al goofing around as well for change. I know, I mean, yeah, it's good because Al's a funny dude. It's, yeah. so it's good to hear him make some jokes, but yeah, that's definitely something they had. So it's kind of like you know the Let It Be stuff where you hear John making up words to get back. Like it's it's that kind of stuff for me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Long promised road, big moment for Carl. Absolutely, he did everything on it besides the. Um, I forget. He didn't play one thing on it. I forget what the party didn't play, but he played everything else. And I didn't one of the most incredible tracks they ever did. It is just hands down a, a classic. And um, I'm glad they named the new Brian documentary after it because it's it speaks to Brian's story for sure. But yeah, that song for me, let alone like personal life, you know, how much I find myself in that song. I really feel like that's a mission statement to them for like the next part of their career they knew where they yeah. came from they knew they got knocked down and they knew they got to pick themselves up to keep going and that whole song is about that and that charged energized spirit that's on there is so palpable 
I mean, it's such an infectious song and it's so well written and it's poetic, but it's rocking at the same time. Awesome. Yeah. Song. What you said then about this like, the mission statement, I often think this would have made a great album opener. Yeah. Because it really sets the tone for what this album, I think, kind of is trying to be or should have been. I think, you know, there's a few songs that, for me, are like the, the core of the flavour of this album. Yeah. And, and this is one of them. And this should have been up front and centre. And, like, bam, this is, this is it. We're, you know, we've got this end of the trail, the weary, uh, sorry, this hand. Right. <laughs> the weary guy, but he's at the end of the long promised road. And now we're, you know, we're moving ahead. I love that idea. Yeah, I'm all for that. That sounds really cool. Uh, one of my favorite things in this song uh, is the synthesizers. Yeah. Um, which, again, there's been a few mixes uh, over the years. I think there's one on, uh, is it on the Hawthorne California CD? I can't remember. That we, you, you, I think you just hear it a little bit bit more prominently mm. in the mix. Yeah. But again, hearing the instrumental, everything stripped back, I was like, oh, that is, that is like heaven. I really I like early, like, uh, like, well, like late 60s kind of like Moog experimentation. Yeah. So Switched like Wendy on. Carlos. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And um, Mort Garson, you know, all this yeah. kind of stuff. So hearing it, I'm like, hearing it being done well, bubbling away in the middle of a Beach Boys song. Um, and this is all Carl, isn't it? Because I think, I think they got hold of a Moog, um, basically. I think it was in 71. Yeah. So he was like a duck to water with this thing. That's the thing, like the, the few people that successfully make a Moog or Moog, whatever you say it, sound like a a part of the band is rare. Like McCartney did it well with Band on the Run, and I think Pete Townsend did it well with Who's Next as making it such a central instrument. And for the Beach Boys to take something that's so out of their wheelhouse and blend it in so perfectly and seamlessly, it's just a testament to how they are as musicians, or specifically Carl, I guess, with this one, but... Um, yeah, it's such a it's such a vital part of that song's energy, that stabbing sort of notes that he pushes into it. Um, it, it just keeps the song's energy up the whole time. Worth noting as well, uh, Jack Riley gets a co-writer. That's right. Credit on this song for uh, well, I think it's just lyrics, right? But he yeah. gets a few co-writes on this album. He does. Um, yeah. Which I imagine could have rubbed up some of the band the wrong way. But I think it's just a stamp yeah. of the fact that he is trying to suggest themes, and it's this, you know, yeah, it's this social conscious ecology theme. Maybe just feeding a few lines here, and finishing. Yeah, there. and he knew what was hip and cool, and he wanted to make the Beach Boys hip and cool. So he knew what to do, and they were super receptive because he respected them just as much as you know. It was a, as they say, mutual appreciation society. It was you know back and <laughs> forth there. So. They liked him, he liked them, and it was cool if he wrote some stuff or even sang on the album. So, you know, it was one of those things. And it worked. I mean, it's a top, top 30 album in the U.S., their best-selling album since Wild Honey, so it worked. Next up, we get Take a Load Off Your Feet. Mm. Things uh, take a bit of a, a left turn into uncharted territory. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you like this song? I'm so wishy-washy with this one. Um, I think it was one of those tracks they had for the last two years that they really didn't want to let it die. And I think they should have, honestly. Like, I like this song, but it could have been a B-side and they could have put one of the nice to live again on here or something else. And um, Al was never a big fan of the production. You know, they make them kind of sound childish and cartoony in the beginning. Like, they got this, oh, shucks, kind of voice. From whatever they do um i like the message of the song about taking care of yourself it blends in with the rest of the album kind of well kind of like help would have done as well h-e-l-p um but yeah the version that they have in the box set from the early 90s that version's bloody great of them doing it in 1993 live i love that version if they had just done it like that for the record hands down but they may get a little too cartoony on an album that's not very cartoony um yeah i like it but not my favorite what about you yeah i think i uh, feel the same about it i'd like it a lot more if it was 
a rarity tucked away on the good vibrations box set <laughs> right. i'd be like oh an undiscovered gem but, <laughs> As it, it should is. be on the album. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Here, you, yeah, it just doesn't fit. And yeah, right. I was reading some stuff. Jack Riley, he like reemerged because basically he goes quiet, doesn't he? After he kind of like dissolves uh, the relationship with the band. But in the mid '90s, he pops up on some like early Beach Boy message board e- email loop thing that's going around oh. um, and it's all there on the smiley smile message port so he says some really interesting stuff but he does address this song um, in relation to I think 4th of July where he kind of said like basically as soon as that song got recorded he said like there were a lot of the band were uh, envious wow um, and some of Dennis's stuff potentially suffered for that reason and probably for the reason that we then discussed last time which like probably didn't have the ambition to push for it to be on the album and yeah it's probably thinking i'm gonna do my solo thing anyway but he kind of said you know <laughs> take a load off your feet was a prime example of like the politics within the band yeah like, that had to go on the album basically to make sure certain people got their stuff represented oh my god maxwell Silverhammer syndrome Oh my god, that is exactly what this is. <laughs> Isn't it even in the same place on the LP? Uh, I think r- Maxwell still have the third song on Happy so, I think it is, yeah. It's been a minute, but I think it is, yeah. <laughs> uh, That's funny. Um, next up, Disney Girls, 1957. Love it. Hands down classic. One of the best things they ever did. Yeah, it's, I agree. It's, yeah, nostalgic. Um, and a lot of people think it has a deeper meaning to before Bruce, Bruce's life kind of changed. He witnessed a pretty grisly murder and then he had to grow up kind of fast and he got involved with the music industry so young. So for a lot of people think it was Bruce's childhood that he missed because he had to grow up so fast. Um, and I wow. think it I does. Heard that. Yeah. I forget who he watched some murder happen. Um, when he was like 17 wow. he was really young and after that he got involved in the music industry really quickly and started working with some big names very fast so that's how he met terry melcher and they started doing their whole thing in the early 60s so young bruce yeah. doesn't get as much credit as he deserves in terms of what he got into in his life and his story he's a very interesting guy but um yeah I mean, when i was kind of um researching the really early genesis of the beach boys like around the time that they're just kind of like going to visit the morgans to do their first demos yeah at the same time you've got bruce releasing his first solo singles yeah he was like already the, working the, on the, 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 the big wigs soupy <laughs> soupy surfer shuffle or yeah. whatever it's called yeah <laughs> yeah he was already doing it you know yeah um and then he was able to copy exactly what brian was doing you know with some of the you know the rip chords and all that kind of stuff so i mean he was involved very early on so they scored big time when they got him in the band but yeah um yeah i think the song fits well in the album because the album's about reflection or looking out for your your life or your surroundings and there's nothing more reflective than your childhood and how it equates to your current life so i mean you know is the song a bunch of syrupy goodness hell yeah but <laughs> damn, is it delicious? I mean, <laughs> when he, when he played this at the 50th anniversary show, I almost plotted. It was one of those like, whoa, he's playing Disney Girls. This is great. Most of the audience was like, yeah, going to the bathroom. But I was like, this is you guys yeah. are missing something classic here. But yeah, what are your thoughts on it? Pretty much the same. Yeah, I really like it, um, and I do feel it fits the vibe. It is, yeah, it is syrupy in a way. In the in the in the way that all the Bruce songs are a bit syrupy, but right? <laughs> I think it, it kind of it kind of avoids being too mawkish because it's got a little bit of that weathered beaten sound to it. Um, yeah, it's a bit sad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, just like yeah, great nostalgic vibe. Just nails nails that tone really. Yeah, it's all the right emotional spots. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's funny because like you know. In America, anyway, between 1957 and 1971, this country changed massively. So, like, you know, it was a whole different place from even when they were 
early teens compared to their mid to late twenties. So, I mean, you know, but that's anyone's generation from when you were a kid to when, you know, we're about the same age. Like when we were growing up in the nineties, it was a whole different world compared to how it is now. So, I mean, you all have that. Oh, remember the toys we had, remember the TV shows we used to watch. Like it's that kind of thing, but um, yeah. Yeah. Excellent song. Just the concept of Disney girls as well to a Brit. I think it's, um, it's such a slice from Americana. Is it? That's interesting. Yeah. Disney girls. They could have called like Sunshine Dream Disney Girls or something. <laughs> oh, that's a perfect idea. Oh my God. I love that name for a box set or a collection. Yeah. It really fits. You know, it would have been a great title. Yeah. Like five, six years later when that rock and roll revival vibe hit in, in the yeah. States. Um, so it's like he's already ahead of the curve here. I know. <laughs> Man, that's cool. Um, another detail now. Student demonstration time. Yeah. Uh, not a lot of people's favorite song, this, but uh, I don't know. Maybe it gets a bit too, uh, bit too lambasted. I, don't know. I like it. I like it. Um, it it's it, the song kind of contradicts itself a couple of times where it's like, you know, it's all about really being involved with what's happening. And there's a couple of lines that I like where the, the, um, the pen is muddier than the sword, but no match for a gun. People rip on that line a lot, but I think it's a pretty good line. Um, and then you get to the very end where they say, stay away when there's a riot going on. The whole song is about being involved with the politics of the now. And they say, stay away when there's a riot going on and go home. And that's the only uh, part that bugs me. But the rest of it, I kind of like, yeah, it's totally a rip off. It's a little bit cheesy. and It definitely sticks out like a sore thumb, but it's not the worst thing they've ever done by far. No, I mean... I find it fairly bland and but inoffensively bland. Right. It's just a it's pretty much straight up cover with the lyrics changed. Um, oh yeah, we should yeah. mention it's cover of Lieber Stoller's uh, right on cell block nine. Right. Um, right. Which they were playing live at the time. Yeah. Which we have a version of here, right? Which is very cool to have that on the box set. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I thought that was a good inclusion. I think if they didn't record it through the the voice, uh, what do they call it? The it's like a tannoy. Table yeah. nine, your pizza's ready. Get down off the couch. <laughs> like that kind of, I forget what they, a bullhorn. If it wasn't through that, or the megaphone, that's what it's called. If they didn't record it through that, I think it wouldn't have dated itself so poorly, but. Um, screeching sirens. Yeah, that's also a bit cheesy too, but I see where they were going. They were trying to be more involved with what was happening. And lyrically, it's about a pretty heavy subject. Um you know, so I respect them for that, but I don't know. It's a fun song. I think musically it's played really well. The background vocals are solid. It's, it's a well-constructed song, but it's, it's not their song. They're just changing the words. So, yeah. yeah I'd rather I, this was, this should have been consigned to a place with going to the beach. <laughs> right. <laughs> this could have been buried for 50 years and then yeah. it would have been a nice, interesting little right Weird song on a, on a box set at some point <laughs> and, yeah right and to put so much effort into a song like this to rearrange the words of a song that already exists and not make it a single or not not put a big push behind it it's just kind of weird how it kind of just chills on this album so awkwardly very yeah, kind yeah. of an odd decision on that one kind of a head scratcher but i think mike probably wanted to have a lead vocal on the album because he's fairly absent from this thing for the most part yeah again i think this is probably one where it was like this is my spot yeah um, but then you would thought well why not push for big sir but, uh, such a better choice great song god they should have done um, that one instead thank god it came back for holland the other thing i was reading a quote from mike from around this time and so like that discrepancy in the message at the end of the song like that wasn't a mistake or like misunderstanding or something he's like no the message of this song is like stay away from these dangerous demonstrations <laughs> from the perspective of uh, a very rich person who has that opportunity to do that yeah thanks mike <laughs> uh, uh, it's so patronizing isn't it <laughs> very much so yeah from his uh, in his right. tower with his many cars yeah that's I think that's one thing that people don't remember either is that like these were rich rock stars and then from the have this like what a grassroots mentality it was definitely I bet for a lot of people a bit jarring and a bit fake but um 
Yeah. It's like that Steve Buscemi meme. It's so always like dressed as a teenager with a backball, um, backwards baseball cap. Like, hello, hello, fellow. fellow. <laughs> <laughs> that is, this is essentially that meme. Right. In, in also, Summer of Love is like that. Yeah. Oh, my God. Jesus. <laughs> yeah. To the nth degree. Well, we got to do that album <laughs> someday. I think that'd be fun to chat about. <laughs> Um, what have we got next? Uh, feel flows. Hell yeah. Oh, yes. I mean, they named the box set after it. It's it's magic in a bottle. You know, it's one of those songs that kind of wilts and floats through time uh, so effortlessly. Carl's vocal is this magic on it. The background vocals are insane. I mean, this this song for me feels like it came out of that Sunflower era where they, they kept that magic of the background vocals being so spiritual. But... Mm. One thing that I have always struggled to identify, and recently it's been a, a discussion again, are they saying white hot glistening or white puff glistening? Well, I didn't, had no idea until I heard this. <laughs> again, somehow the lyrics of this have just completely passed me by. It's almost like they're just wordless sounds. Um, but obviously, yeah, having it all stripped back here, I was like, those can't be the lyrics. I know. I'd rather have, I'd rather have not known. <laughs> and they named one of those episodes on YouTube, White Hot Glistening Shadowy Flows. And I'm like, is that really what it is? Because if you listen close, it sounds like the same puff. There's like a, I'm pretty ah, sure it's at puff. The end. And that makes That's more sense. Puff. Like a puffy, watery, you know, ocean. White Hot Glistening Shadowy. You're like, what the hell is that? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> uh, not the finest lyrics. Um, they're better better off buried in the mix. Right. <laughs> what do you think of it? Oh, yeah, fantastic. I think when we were talking about uh, All I Want to Do, we said this is like evolution yeah. of that sound, isn't it? Yeah. A super spiritual, laid back, chill wave. Yeah. Kind of vibe. <laughs> Um, it's interesting that this got used for the name of the box set because it's by no means high profile song on either of these albums, but it's just had this sort of renaissance. I can remember when people started first talking about this box set and feel flows was being chucked around. And I don't remember anyone like saying that officially. It's like yeah. fans just decided we want it to be called Feel Flows. <laughs> and that just became, that was it. Then, and then people were like, right to the label and tell them we won't feel flows yeah and no one ever stopped to question it i almost feel like it was done because it's so easy to say it's quick it's succinct it's short but also it had its its a, its moment from uh, almost famous it was using the credits at the end of almost famous when was uh, that uh, 2000 or 2001 99 somewhere in there uh, um uh... i can't remember when it came out but yeah, they use the song in the credits. So that's the only reason why most people I knew growing up even knew what this song was, was from right. that movie. So I think that might be why they chose it, which for the next box set, I really hope they call All This Is That would be perfect for the next box set instead of yeah. Sail On Sailor because that song's had a life. It's had its own popularity. like, And it's such a singular thing. All This Is That is open-ended, you know, but that's a whole I like thing. it. Yeah. I like it. I'm calling it now. Uh, <laughs> Capital. Um, this is another one, Feel Flows, I think. It would have sat nicely um, alongside Long Promised Road. Yeah. Like you get Long Promised Road and then you're into the, to that vibe. And I just, like, those two tracks that start the album are really, I think they just start to give it a different complexion. Like if you start the album off with stuff like that, 100%. rather than being a bit more, a bit more buried. Yeah. Because this, again, this to me is like the backbone of this album. Um, That's interesting. So they're buried. I agree with that. I never thought of it that way, but I definitely agree. Yeah. This is one of my favorite albums to resequence. <laughs> oh, this one's, is, oh, yeah. You could do a lot with this one. <laughs> um, but then we move into Looking at Tomorrow, a yeah. welfare song. Um, I really like this. And again, it's one that I often overlooked. Mm -hmm. Um it's kind of short and um, it's very unusual isn't it in terms of its arrangement for a beach Boys yeah song. very it sounds like just a lonely kind of 
like a railroad worker or something. He's just like stops off in a in a bar in a little dusty town and he's just there. He can't get any work. And he, I can just imagine him like sitting in this like dark bar with like one light on. He's in the shadows. And it's just one guy singing this little song with his acoustic guitar. I love um, that imagery. I get it completely. Yeah. I mean, this is a real embracing of, again, I, th- I think what we move towards more with the next two albums of kind of like a more of a like Americana roots kind yeah. of uh, approach. So like, and this one for me feels way more believable than student demonstration time does one because they wrote it, but two Al comes from that folk rock idiom. And so he's, he grew up with that feeling. He's from the wind West originally or New York. I figure where he came from, but um, I mean, a lot of their families had that, you know, making it, making it in America kind of thing, traveling across the country to get to California. And they all kind of started their families over there. The whole Beach Boys camp was like that. Um, but for some reason, when they sing about welfare, like it, it seems a little more honest. It seems a little bit mm. more truthful. Um, and I think because it's so stripped back and it's mostly, I think it's just Al on this song. Um, yeah. and I think it was one of the last few vocals the towards the end. It's a few, but that, yeah. that could just be him. I think it might be. Um, he's always seemed so down to earth and never full of himself. So when he sings about something yeah. honest like this, it's going to earnest kind of quality to it. That makes it so believable, but yeah, it's definitely one of those songs that gets completely forgotten about. No one ever talks about this track. It's such a deep cut. Um, yeah. But a really great little song. Good job, Al. And I love, I loved it here on the box set. I don't know if it's the um, mix they've presented as part of the album or an alternative mix, but one of them, has really got it. Just adds an extra edge, and there's a, a, they've done something to just bring out a lot more atmosphere and a little bit of that, yeah, like tension in it. And I really, really, I really love the version here. Yeah. Um, again, I've said this a few times for a few songs, but it's like hearing it anew. Never heard it. Yeah, before. that's that's the great thing about this box set. I mean, yeah, it's fantastic. So then, a day in the life of a tree. Quite an unusual song, I think, on this album and, and in the catalogue of the Beach Boys. Probably yeah. because it's the Jack Riley vocal, right? But um, I think that divides opinion on it right down the middle. 100%. Yeah. How do you I feel about it? I think the first time, yeah, when I first heard Surf's Up, I struggled to get into this song. Um, but eventually, uh, there was one thing that happened that kind of revealed to me it's sheer beauty and an actual kind of like the emotional core and it kind of like basically I heard someone do a version of it that was so good that it translated to me and after hearing that I understood the song and every time I now hear it I feel that same emotional depth um but the frustration of my life (laughs) is that I cannot find that song again because I heard it once on the radio yeah. There's a guy called Ed Harcourt. Um, and he was doing some kind of radio session where he's like, I'm live in this live in the studio. Yeah. And I remember him saying, Oh, I'm on tour and I, I just bought this uh beat up accordion in a uh, junk shop. <laughs> and I'm gonna have a go at doing a day in the life of a tree. What the hell? <laughs> and he did he did a solo performance just with accordion of a day in the life of a tree. Yeah. And it was so incredible, so moving. Oh my god! And it just really got to the core of that like emotional depth. And I was like, oh my god! And for the last twenty years, I've intermittently tried to <laughs> seek it out. And yeah. I'm like, what is what? You know, we have the internet now, people. <laughs> Stuff like this is supposed to be immediately available to yeah, me. Yeah, readily time. out there. Right, right. All media of all time. That's- so I actually, during lockdown, I was bored enough that it occurred to me and I thought, I'm going to message him because he's appeared on Instagram now. Yeah. So I just sent him a message and I was like, I don't even want the song, but can you just let me know, did, am I mad? Because I can't find anyone who even remembers this or yeah. there's no reference to it or anything. And he was like, oh, yeah, I do remember doing that. <laughs> <laughs> So I'll see if I can dig it out if I've got a recording of it. And then he, you know, then he vanished. So oh my God. If anyone's watching, 
and they they heard this song on the radio circa 2001 probably or maybe a bit later 2002 2003 let me know send in a message <laughs> that but after incredible. that i was like wow i really get it and i think it's one of the most heartbreaking songs i've ever heard um and obviously you know kind of knowing what's going on with brian when you've got that context um it just becomes just unbearably sad yeah yeah um this is a song i still struggle with because of jack's voice and i get it like i understand how his voice is supposed to benefit the feel of the track uh lyrically i think it's absolutely amazing um yeah there's a lot going on lyrically and musically it's a very different song for them too but it's not my favorite track but it's one that i always think that someday i'm gonna really really love um it's gonna hit me in the right spot just like your story and it's gonna change my mind um but it's one that i very frequently how do i word this i never listen to it yeah. um <laughs> if it comes up on the album as i'm playing it as a whole i'll keep it on but i know what's coming up next and I, I want to hear those two instead. So sure. I'm really hoping, you know, I'm waiting for the day when I can love this song again. <laughs> it just pops like a magic eye. Right. And one day you can see it and then you can't unsee it. <laughs> and that happened for me a long time ago with Feel Flows. I was in high school or college. And for me, that song at the time was always like, and eh, a bunch of nonsense that goes nowhere. It's just kind of this little dribbly song. And one day it hit me. I was like, oh my God, this thing's incredible. So I mean... <laughs> I think that's what's great about music is that one day you don't like it, the next day you do. And there's nothing yeah. wrong with that. It's great. Yeah. So um, yeah. this decision, yeah, to have Jack Riley sing it, um, apparently he didn't even realize that he was singing it. Like, right, I right. Think, I think Brian, he, I think he tried some of the guys. For some I th- People didn't like it as well, I think. I get the impression. They didn't want to sing it. It's kind of a dreary um, song. I mean, yeah. I can imagine there was a lot of resistance to this uh, song. But yeah. Story goes, he got he got Jack in the booth just to say, I just want to like, you know, set up some levels and stuff. Can you sing? And then he said he looked up and Brian's like smiling with glee. And he's like, that's it, it's in the can. <laughs> <laughs> Classic Brian. Uh, oh my god well like, i got the liner notes out here and it says lead vocal jack riley with alan and van dyke parks i didn't realize Al- that van dyke parks sang on the song no news to me he must be there at the end right he must be buried in the uh, mix somewhere. Yeah, yeah with al that's so cool. al does a great job on this as well i love yeah. his uh, vocal it's yeah fantastic. i do like al on this one yeah a very interesting song and I- i'm I think someday I'll appreciate it more. I, th- I think after talking about it, I might go back and play it again and see what kind of magic is of the grooves. I think it's a great lead in as well for Till I Die. Yes. You know, I mean, these, these lyrics, they're really, they really are quite dark when you think oh my about God. they're about, about a person rather than a tree. Right, right. And this idea of like, well, like slow death and uh, like slowly being killed and poisoned. Could you imagine um, if like Bauhaus did this song or Joy Division? <laughs> it's right up their I'm alley. I'm surprised actually. I'm surprised totally, more bands haven't covered this. Yeah, it's totally like a like a Peter Murphy song. I mean, it's like <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to hear it. <laughs> um, so yeah, till I die. Oh my god. This is up there for me, like top five, definitely Beach Boy songs. Ever. Absolutely love it. Yeah. yeah. One of the best things they ever did. Um, yeah, heartbreaking. It's amazing how they split up those few sections and, you know, you're a leaf or you're uh, a cork in the ocean, you know, you're walking a landslide and like moving with that imagery. Um, and then just ending with this, like, that coda of all those voices blending together. And Brian's falsetto, um, you know, and Mike doing, you know, these things I'll be till I die, the way he sings that, the whole delivery, everyone was just on fire with the message of this song, and they nailed it. Absolutely. Yeah, eventually. Right, yeah, de- well said. It was not, didn't start that way. <laughs> <laughs> well, this was one of my highlights. This is one of the 
like three things that I was really hoping to hear on this box set was this rumored optimistic version the ha- the of happy version. Die. <laughs> These yeah. things I'll be until I die. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't quite happy enough for me. I was hoping <laughs> something really outrageous. If um, everybody had it till I die, across yeah. the USA. <laughs> But it was still quite like, oh, my God, even though I was anticipating it. I mean, I never thought it would be on here. I, just, I wasn't even sure if it really existed or if it was just something where, like, it was a demo that wasn't recorded. It was like a rehearsal. But, um, yeah, great to hear it. All this, like, because who spoke about it? Um, what's his name? Peter Amos Carlin, I think. Yeah. He wrote a book on the Beach yeah. Boys. Yeah, and he, he did an interview on one of those... Um, Brian Wilson's songwriter documentaries where he spoke yeah. about it. He's yeah. like, you know, Mike wanted it to be, oh, it's too depressing. And it's more like the water holds me up or something. It lifts <laughs> me up, the wind. And, um, but again, I think it kind of shows, you know, people who kind of like blame Mike for like the collapse of smile and other things. Like, Brian had power of veto if he, if he cared enough about a song. Right. And obviously, yeah, he, they, they gave it a go, but he must have put his foot down and said, no, this isn't, yeah, this isn't the intent. <laughs> this isn't what I want. And also because like, he's not on most of this album. So the, the few songs that he actually is on and had a ton of creative input on, I think he was like, no, this is how it's going to go. And Bruce yeah. at one point said, this is the last great Brian Wilson song. It certainly last brian wilson song cast in this mold well said yeah yeah he wrote a lot of great songs after this too but yeah it's one of the most amazing things they ever put on tape unbelievable yeah. song and it's one of the earliest ones recorded for the album too um it says the basic yeah. track was recorded in august of 1970 so i mean sunflower hadn't even come out yet and they were already working on this stuff so it's yeah yeah crazy Could have been. Song. Could have been on that landlocked with Leap to Leap and oh, God. Susie Cincinnati. That would have been a terrible album. <laughs> oh my God. Uh. Um, <laughs> and then, I mean, I like this whole string of these three songs together ending the album. I think it works really well. Yes, so, a very yeah. strong ending. Surfs up to end the whole album. I mean, there's so much to say about this song potentially. Yeah, uh, it's don't um, want to dig too much into the uh, the smile vault, the lore. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's such a deep. Yeah, I mean, there's so much involved with this song. We could spend a day talking about just this one track, but um, it's funny. The longer I've done this, the more I've talked to people on, on the internet, and they've been like, "I don't like that Surf's Up was on this album. It should have been just kept for Smile." like cool cool water and those other stuff I'm like no it's a great song and it stands on its own like yeah was it supposed to be for smile of course but does it work on its own yeah it doesn't sound awkward um you know it's got its own little life and it could have been on any album and still had that magic to it so i also like that they took old elements and added the new elements and made its own version out of it so it wasn't just rehashing a song like, like cabin essence or our prayer on 2020 it was a brand new for the most part, recording. Yeah, because people forget it wasn't finished. Yeah. In 1967. So there's still yeah. quite a lot of work to, to do to figure out what's the arrangement here and how do we end it. Yeah. Um, and I mean, it's quite interesting going into the, like, the shit industry around this track. You know, um, Carl and Jack Riley apparently spending weeks with the Smile Master tapes going through and then going, oh my God, hang on. We thought we needed this song. There's all this other stuff. <laughs> Forgot about this one. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and Brian, uh, it's kind of hard to know from, you know, reading around really what he might have felt about this, but yeah, he seemed to pick and choose the moments where he wanted to engage. Yeah. Um, he apparently accompanied um, Jack Riley to a meeting with Mo Austin where he basically was like, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to do surfs up. So he kind of put himself in that position to commit. And then I think spent the next few months trying to like roll back on it, but they were like, no, <laughs> oh, crap. I got to do it now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Now I've done it. And I yeah. think he, yeah, he advised Carl a bit. And then when they came to record it, like I think over three or four days or whatever, how long they were spending on it, uh, like Stephen Desper said, when they got to that recording the coder at the end, and they obviously decided let's use um, Child is uh, Father of the Man. Right. And let's make that the ending. Um, so that was a creative decision that hadn't been made in 1967. Great move, um, too. Yeah, it works really well. And apparently that's when Brian got excited and came down in his pajamas and was like, oh, yeah, now he's going to start directing. And it's like he can smell blood, right? right. <laughs> <laughs> done. Brian the bear wakes up hungry for more. Yeah, yeah it's... um. And I think as a promotional effort was the smartest move they could have made at that time because like yeah. people knew about the legend of smile already at that point. And if you were in the music industry or you were a humongous beach boys fan, you knew that album never came out. And so to know that the album was named after this song that you may have seen on TV once in 1966 to hear them finishing it, it must've been a thrill. Like when I talked to David leaf a few months ago, who did the liner notes for the Beach Boys CDs in the 90s, and he's been with the band so cool. for 50 years, whatever it was. Um, he was telling me at one point, I don't, I don't know if this is in the video or not, but he was telling me at one point that when he was buying their records in the 60s and early 70s, he knew about Smile. And then when this album came out with that song on there, that was the selling point, was to be like, I got to buy this album for that Lost Smile track, because you were collecting all the pieces here over the last couple of albums. Um, you know, people were already starting to make their collections together from mixtapes, but... Um, and I really think it's what helped sell it because it was such a well charting album, let alone the rest of the songs on this record. But this is definitely the pinnacle of like, you've played the whole album to get to this point. Here you are. Here's what you came for. You know, this is your reward for being good. So yeah, like that. incredible track. I suppose that was Carl's mentality, right? Cause he was the one who yeah. pushed to have this included and he pushed for it to be the last song. Which caused Denny. that conflict with Dennis, <laughs> <Right>. yeah. Because <laughs> he really um, wanted, wanted to be nice to live again as the last yeah. song. And like, that song would have fit really well on the album, but I think Surf's Up is, well, they're good. They're both good ending songs. That's the tricky part. Yeah. I, I would have accepted Surf's Up closing side A. I think that would have worked. Interesting. I think it does. It has a, it has a sense of finality. As, oh yeah, as it, as it ends, so it has to go sort of at the end. But I think at the side right. of, end of side A, and then a break. Yeah, because I also like the idea of uh, day in the life of a tree till I die. Wouldn't it be nice to live again? Ooh, that juxt- juxtaposition <laughs> is pretty sweet. Yeah, I can dig that. Um, yeah, I mean the fact that they got Brian involved and interested in finishing up a song that he had zero interest in ever doing again, and plus like. It's called Surf's Up. It's the most un-anti-surfing song ever. And it plus it, it it kind of goes with Don't Go Near the Water. It's two tracks about yeah. not being near the water. I mean, this song has nothing to do with Surf's Up, but that that chorus that that Surf's Up, mm-hmm, the board of tidal wave, like there's such a stronger image to that, which I think blends well until I die. Um so it's funny how those two songs were uh, written a couple years apart from each other, but there's similar themes. So they blend yeah. well together. I've always interpreted Surf's Up as like the surf's gone. It's done. There's no more. Yeah, I can definitely see that. Which is probably why we get this hype. Just two large photos of just dry earth. <laughs> yeah. At least, <laughs> least thrilling booklet. If everybody had <laughs> a desert. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>